and we're live. Hola, buenas tardes. Marhaba, bonjour. Thank you all for joining us today for our third COVID-313 town hall in supporting Detroit's immigrant community additions. We will start in a few minutes. We are translating this town hall into Spanish, Arabic, and ASL. We would like to give time for those to call in to their native uh, language translation for them to settle in. Gloria, please share the Spanish line. Si necesita traducción en español, hable al teléfono 313-626-7440. Hoy su servidora, Gloria Rosas y Cristina Ruiz harán la traducción. Gracias, Gloria. Said, please share the phone number for Arabic translation. In kunta bihajatin le tarjamati ila lugati la arabia, arraja al utisal ala rakam 313-241-7030. Al rakam mujadadan huwa 313-241-7030. Maakum Said wa Najwa Dahtah wa nahnu mustaaddun li khidmatikum. Thank you. Katie or Julie, please share the instructions for ASL. Thank you, Denise. So welcome to our third virtual COVID-313 town hall in supporting Detroit immigrant families during the COVID crisis. I am Ophelia Martinez and I am a community organizer at DHDC, Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. I am also an assistant director of Detroit's Ballet Proclorico Moyoko Yanise, a traditional Mexican folk dance here in Southwest Detroit. The COVID-313 Coalition for Families and Students consists of more than 25 organizations that have united to be a resource for you. The coalition is made of parents, is made for parents, guardians, youth, and family members, just like you. We are all working hard to give the resources to the community and to help guide the community through these difficult times. We know that families and students need facts support and resources that you can use right now to continue to stay safe, healthy, and fully understand how to navigate this new way of life with social distancing at the same time staying connected with our loved ones. We want all of our families to be safe and stay safe and empowered. This is why today we have organized a special session to ensure that our immigrant communities are receiving all the information that they need. For themes Today, we are focused on issues that affect immigrant families and students. During each section, we will have a live Q&A answers. Today's guest speakers are Cristian Andrade from Congress of Communities, Ophelia Martinez from Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation, Diana Conate, from Policy Director of African Communities Together, Sally Marshall from the Secretary of State, Isra Darase from Access, Elvira Hernandez from the ACLU of Michigan, Gabriela Santiago Romero from the Southwest Mutual Aid Fund, Catalina Rios, SEM Undocumented Fund, Fatima Tayebi from the African Bureau of Immigrant and Social Affairs, Marwa Arache from Me Student Dreams, Roberto Torres, Director of City of Detroit, Immigrant Affairs and Economic Inclusion. And we will also have a music performance from Usma Balaki and Michael Abraham from the National Arab Orchestra. Please get comfy to and engage with us for the next 90 minutes so that you can ask your questions to obtain your answers that you will need to stay informed and empowered. We want to know what you think. To ask your questions, please use the Facebook chat. We will have Q and A's after each segment. If we cannot answer your questions today, we promise to have the correct answers for you and we can email them to you if you like. All the questions asked today will be published on onedetroitpbs.org. Gloria, please share the number for live Spanish translations for those who are now just joining. Con mucho gusto. Uh, si necesita traducción en español, hable por favor al teléfono 313-626-7440. Gracias, Gloria. Sai, please share the phone number for Arabic translation. In Kunta Bihajatin Literjamati Ila Lugati Larabia, 
الرجاء الاتصال على رقم 313-241-7030 الرقم مجددا هو 313-241-7030 وشكرا Thank you. Denise, please share the instructions for ASL. Now moderating our sessions today will be Rima uh, from Access and Sadie Sar. I will turn it over to Rima. Thanks, Ophelia. Um, thank you all for joining us. So we're getting ready to get started and we want to welcome those who just joined us. Uh, my name is Rima Merway. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at ACCESS, the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services. Uh, before we start this town hall, I want to thank you for joining the COVID-313 Community Coalition for Families and Students. And just in case we have any technical difficulties, please stick with us and we will uh, return as soon as we can. Uh, we're grateful to all our expert panelists who could join us today. We have asked them to share with you three to five minutes of important piece, three to five important pieces, excuse me, of information that immigrant families need to know right now. Uh, our experts, uh, for our experts, please remember to speak slowly for our translators, which is a good reminder for me as well. Uh, they want to make sure that they are translating the important information that you are sharing. Also, please remember to turn off your cameras when you are not speaking to ensure uh, our ASL interpreters can be seen. You will have five minutes to share and Ophelia will send a chat message to let you know your remaining time. And if you go over five minutes, I can gently remind you uh, to wrap up. So we will also be asking questions from our guests at the end of each of the segments and at the end of all the segments. So before we begin, uh, we want to take time to celebrate our rich, diverse cultures, and we will have my friend and co-moderator, co Sadie, speak about the end of Ramadan. She is being joined by my amazing colleague, Isra Duraisi. Sadie and Isra. Thank you. Thank you, Rima, uh, for uh, nice introductions. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. My name is Sadie, and I am uh, co-presenting with uh, Isra today. Hi, peace, everyone. I'm really excited to take as maximum five minutes to describe um, Eid and Ramadan with everyone. Thank you for having us. So let me share the screen so we can dive into um, we can dive into what Ramadan is about. Um, and uh, we are at the end of the month. This is um, it was a holy month of Ramadan for us, and. Uh, this weekend we will be celebrating the end of Ramadan and today I am going to be able, if I can share my screen, I'll be able to present um, what Ramadan is about. So to Thank that, you. Just add, I just want to add that with five minutes, by the way, we're not going to be able to cover the depth of this, of this amazing, beautiful month. So I just want to put that out there and we'll try our best. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so first of all, I want folks to know that Ramadan start, um, when is Ramadan? Ramadan start when the new crescent moon appears immediately after sunset. In the past, people have relied on naked eyes to see the moon changes, but now we use telescopes and uh, to, to seek for the moon and see it. So when we seek for the moon and see, it, then all Muslims around the world can start the holy month, which is the month of Ramadan, which is a month of fasting. This year, um, we started fasting right after um, the Catholic, when they finished, we, we took the baton right after from them and start our month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan commemorates the revelation of the Quran. Um, the month of Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic and lunar calendar. Ramadan is a time to purify uh, for us the soul, to refocus your attention on Allah or God and practice self-discipline and, um, and sacrifice. So often in the month of Ramadan, you would hear Muslims saying, well, I'm fasting. And, uh, and the question that we often have is, so can you have water? What would be the answer um, to that, Isra? The answer is not even water. Not even water, yes. So we fast from um, sunset to sundown and we don't eat. We refrain from eating, from drinking. Um, we refrain from gossiping. 
even you should not gossip usually we will you actually refrain of a lot of things that you engage that you know are not the best one so you actually use this month to refocus yourself and um try to get back to your best self Ramadan is also a month of mercy. Uh, for us Muslims, we do believe that during the month of Ramadan that the doors of paradise are open. So we increase prayers, you know, salat, we increase the reading and the recitation of the Quran, which is like same thing as the Bible or the Torah. And we increase uh, a lot of salawat prayers on the, the Prophet wasalam, and we stay up all night sometimes to pray and ask God for forgiveness and ask God for blessings upon us, upon our families and so on and so forth. And every year Ramadan change is like moves around because the Muslim calendar is what we call a lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is purely lunar, is contained 12 months based on the phases of the moon. So each lunar month is approximately 29.53 solar days. So the Islamic calendar is shorter than the Gregorian calendar. And um, the year for the Islamic calendar would be maybe 354 days, 10 or 12 days shorter than the regular solar calendar. So that's why the month of Ramadan gets earlier every year. Can I add that a lot of us are really excited when it's in December because we get to eat around 5 p.m.? That's true. Common practices. So, all right, so I will take it from here. Um, and please jump in, Sadie, if you have anything to add or any anecdotes. Um, as you all can see, some of the points that we're, we're trying to convey is that um, common things that Muslims engage in is to refrain, obviously, from what Sadie was saying, eating, drinking, bad actions, thoughts, and words from sunrise to sunset. That doesn't mean that after sunset, you get to do all the bad things. Um, however, it's, it's almost like a marathon and a training. We're, we're, doing the, we're dedicating ourselves in this month so that the rest of the year could flow on a very um, filtered and very um, 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 positive note. And so that you are, you know, you kind of have these common practices become routine again and the, until the next time that we get to see Ramadan. Um, we are to make peace with those who have wronged us, strengthen ties with family and friends, and do away with bad habits. Again, it's all about a training session and a training month to make sure that we're reminded and we're kind of focused back onto what's really important in life and just making sure that we're our best version of ourselves. Um, in order to be able to sustain ourselves, we have a pre um, a pre dawn breakfast, which is usually around three four a.m., um, where you wake up and you have something light but something sustainable. So a lot of common things that people eat are um, dates, which are really really they're filled with a lot of good sugar and good energy um, to sustain you for the rest of the day. And we also break fast with that. That's another common practice is to break fast with the with the date. We all um, avocados are another common thing that we we might eat things that will give us energy long standing, not things that quickly give you energy. Some people tidbit will um, actually drink their morning coffee at that time because they're deprived of it for the whole day. Um, <clears throat> another thing is that we participate in nightly prayers and gathering in our mosques. So obviously with COVID-19, unfortunately, this has taken a really big hit on folks and has impacted their spirituality and ability to be able to connect with um, their creator because a lot of us get that feeling when we go to the mosque and you get to really see that communal um, and, and collective ass beauty of, of Ramadan and how it brings people together. Um, during Ramadan, that's actually one of the, the highest attendance rates um, in the mosque because folks are really, really feeling the month. And one way to feel even more engaged is by being there in company with your community, your neighbors, um, friends and family. And, and a lot of times you're seeing people that you haven't seen all year. Um, so I, I personally so fast. I'm sure that our ASL interpreter is running around behind us. <laughs> I'm just trying to respect the five minutes and I feel like we're let me go to the, the comments. See if yeah. we're getting close. We have two minutes left. Okay, cool. All right, I'll try to go a little slower. Um <laughs> the the next point is that the physical effects of the fast are a reminder of those who suffer throughout the year. So the poor, the homeless, refugees, those with less um, than uh, certain in those circumstances. Um, it reminds Muslims not to be wasteful and to feel empathy for those who face hunger on a daily basis. But something that's not on this on the slide is the fact that, and you can go to the next one because I'll get to it, um, Sadie, is the fact that this is also a month of true 
devotion and reflection with your creator because no one really can tell if you're if you've been fasting all day or not you know I could tell you I'm fasting today but who's there to really um to to check me and say no I saw you eating there's only one one entity that will really know if I was eating or not so again this 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 month is is truly beautiful in the sense that it it gives you discipline and it really makes you reflect on yourself and you look in the mirror and you're you're facing your own self there's no one else to tell you um whether you should be fasting or not because at the end of the day no one will know um and last but not least the be- the favorite and best part of our uh of our fasting is the um Eid al-Fitr, which is commemorating the end of Ramadan, where we gather. It's very similar to Christmas um, and Thanksgiving It's um, or Thanksgiving. It's an all-day fellowship that starts with a morning service at your local mosque. And again, because we're not able to gather together, a lot of different mosques around Detroit and around Canton and all over the state and the country are doing drive-by Eids, which is really amazing. They have you decorate your car and you can win a contest. And this is honestly also an amazing time for, and I know I have one minute, for children. This is this is their time where they get some money from their uncles, aunts, um, a time for you to wear your best outfit. It, it, it's also recommended that you buy something new, you wear something new. Um, and so you'll still see people wearing their 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 Sunday best for a lack of a better um, yeah. analogy. And um, yeah, I'm really excited for Saturday night to be able to eat and celebrate with my community, whether virtually or by drive-by. So happy, you know, Ramadan Mubarak to everybody, you know, happy Eid this weekend. We will be celebrating all across the world and in very different cultural uh, setting. In Senegal, we say, you know, Donati and Bonne Fête de Kourite. We say Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you so much for talking about the end of Ramadan celebrations, Sadie and Isra. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's wonderful to see our beautiful cultures coming together. Um, I want to turn it back to Sadie, who will introduce our next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Um, and I am following with my page now because I was like changing, um, changing slides. This was not the best one for today. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, like we say, Detroit has all the beautiful culture and all the beautiful community. Once again, my name is Sadie and I'm the founder of the African Bureau for Immigration and Social Affairs. So it is important for us to keep talking about how being seen as a culture, as a community is important how being counted is important. This is a year that the United States is counting its people. And wherever we come from, if we are living in this country, we need to be counted. So yes, I know we have been saying it over and over again, but this is census year. So we're gonna repeat it, 2020 is a census. And in Detroit here, we need you to fill out your census. In Michigan, we need you to fill out your census. It is important for us and for the city of Detroit and especially for our immigrant communities. So here today to talk to us again about the census is Christian Aranda from the Cong- Congress of Communities and Ophelia Martinez from DHDC, Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. Welcome Christian and welcome Ophelia. Hello, Sadie, Ophelia here. I I believe Christian um, is having some technical difficulties, so she's not in quite yet, but I'm gonna start. So like we are presented, I am Ophelia Martinez from Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. And we're here today to speak a little bit about the census. I know that in many of the town halls, we're talking about the census and how important it is for our communities, especially our communities of color, our our immigrant communities to be counted. Uh, The census relies on those numbers to give us the support and the resources that we need for our communities. For example, um, childcare or school lunches, uh, early child Head Start um, in Southwest, we have one of the highest populations of children from zero, from ages zero to five. And so we wanna think about the next 10 years. So maybe you don't have children now, but maybe in 10 years you will, and how are they gonna benefit from the census of today. So we're looking for fundings for our schooling programs, for our immigrant communities, for school lunches, for college grants, for the future, right? So we're thinking about the future, even though we think today it's not gonna matter, but we're thinking about our future and our communities. 
um, ahead. Uh, Detroit has, and especially in Southwest and cer certain areas, we have a very low census rate outcome. And we wanna, we wanna encourage that. So we wanna boost, boost that information, boost um, the motivation to do it. Many people, especially in our immigrant communities are concerned about uh, the citizen question, which is not gonna be on the, the census. Um, our information is private, right? The census doesn't release information for about seven decades, seven years. So by the time that information is released, most of us will not, not be here. So we're asking our community not to be afraid to, to make our voices be heard, right? We need things, we, we uplift the city, like we, um, Sadie had mentioned, our cultures, our, our colors make this city of Detroit what it is today. So we wanna be counted to receive all the grants, all the fundings needed for, for our communities. Yeah. Especially right now going through the COVID um, issues, uh, we're, we are lacking uh, medical supplies, right? So for a census, they, they need that to see in the future if this happens again or something else happens that our hospitals are, are stocked, that they're, they're ready to serve and they can help our communities. So just, you know, real quick, I know many probably are tired of hearing about the census, but we need you to fill it out for Detroit to get what it, what it needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that reminder about the importance that we are all counted in the census 2020 because we are here, our communities are here, like you said, our children are going to school and we have to plan ahead. And the census help our yes. communities do exactly that. So please, we, we are begging you guys, we are really begging you to fill out this census so we can all be counted. Next we have- I believe Christiane is on, on now. So if Christiane can turn on her camera. Hello everyone. Hello Christiane. Hi Saidi, how are you everyone? Um, I know Felia talk about the census now, and I would like to uh, to talk to the um, um, undocumented families who are worried about confidentiality. But let me tell you something: uh, the information is protected by the by the Title 13 of the U.S. Code. I know. Yo sé que las familias indocumentadas están preocupadas acerca de la confidencialidad, pero déjenme decirles que su información es protegida por el Título 13 de la de los de la, del Código de los Estados Unidos. The Census Bureau cannot release any information about you, your home, even to law enforcement agencies. It is a federal crime. El, la oficina del censo no puede compartir ninguna información acerca de usted, su hogar, porque es, una, es un crimen federal y no puede compartir la información con agencias de la ley. Every census employee takes, a, takes an oath to uh, protect your personal information for life. Cada empleado del censo toma un juramento de por vida para proteger su información. Any violation comes with a penalty of, of $250,000 and up to five years in prison. Cada uh, empleado toma un juramento y si ellos cometen alguna violación acerca de compartir su información, tienen una multa de $250,000 y hasta cinco años en prisión. Uh, I would like to say something about the, the agencies. Um, the majority of the nonprofits and agencies in the city of Detroit had a plan before to support Census uh, 2020. Our plan was to talk to you in person and educate our community why it is important to complete the 2020 Census. La mayoría de nuestras agencias eh, que son sin fines de lucro y la ciudad de Detroit teníamos un plan para apoyar el Censo. Pero nuestro plan pues se vino abajo con el coronavirus y eh, nuestro plan era hablar con la gente en la comunidad en persona. But the, the coronavirus messed up our plans and um, made harder to get information. Y nos hizo más difícil dar información. Ahora, you can, you can help us. If you fill it out your, your census 2020, we want to say thank you. And you can ask your family, your neighbor, your friends, if they fill out the 2020 census. Ahora ustedes pueden ayudarnos. Ustedes pueden preguntar a las familias, a sus vecinos, a, a su comunidad si llenaron el censo. Si ustedes ya lo hicieron, muchas gracias. Y si no lo han hecho, este, pues los, los uh, motivamos a que lo hagan y que nos pueden ayudar de esta manera preguntando este, si, si nos pueden ayudar a, a, compartir la, a compartir el hecho de que llenen el censo. 
Um, now I know. Um, I'm sorry, I'm oh, I'm nervous. No, you're good. <laughs> you're good. It was Christian. I, I can I can step in real quick. I know too. Um, along for helping with the census, uh, DHDC has two census challenges for our communities. We have one on, on our Facebook pages. We follow us, uh, uh, Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation, or you can also tag AMO DHDC for to a chance to enter into a raffle that we have for a census challenge. We have rules. Um, let us know that you filled out your census and why is it important to fill out your census and challenge five family members or friends to do the same and they can enter in our, our excuse me in our raffle also something fun maybe for the kids we have a sidewalk challenge as well so maybe in certain parts of Detroit or in Southwest you've seen certain messages um, from DHC saying to fill out the census that the census is in Spanish and it's a challenge so Hopefully we can get more people involved in these two um, challenges to get our numbers up in the census this year. And I really, I really want to say uh, thank you, Christian, and thank you, Ophelia, because you. it is showing how the communities are actually taking it into their own hand. And like, yeah, like Christian has reminded us, right, uh, coronavirus have happened, and everything that was planned in the city of Detroit to let us know how important it is to engage our communities to fill out the census. We can knock at door no more and talk to you. We would love to do that, but the COVID is not allowing us to do that. However, like they reminded us, it's a community effort, it's a personal effort. So like Christian said, for our undocumented families, don't be scared. Your information is protected. You just need to be counted because these resources are going into our communities, are going to help us to have access to language access services, for example, and so on and so forth. So, and the example of the challenges, you know, this is a great way for our community to be engaged and to continue engaging our neighbors. So let's talk to our neighbors let's share a small conversation let's share a small video but let's make sure that at the end of this we are all counted and that we will have the resources we need to come out of this to support our businesses to support our school to support our families but also to be prepared for the next 10 years coming and we want to remind you also to continue to ask questions and to send your questions in the chat so that the moderators we can transfer those questions and we can also make sure the questions are answered so if you have questions please don't forget right now to type them in the chat so we can address those and thank you again uh, for this information about the census. Next, we will have Ms. Sally Marsh. She's the Director of Special Program at the Secretary of State, and she will share information about how can we have a say as a community member in the redistricting. Welcome, Sally. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me today to talk about uh, uh, an issue that relates directly to the census, to just what we were talking about, about fair representation um, and, and equal access. So let me just quickly share my screen. Um, it says that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know if someone else can share the slides, um, but I can just get started uh, without them as well. So um, I wanna talk to you today about redistricting. Uh, there, we have a historic moment in Michigan's democracy right now to get involved and volunteer to be the citizens uh, and the voters who are shaping district lines in Michigan for the next 10 years. Uh, redistricting is the process that is done throughout the United States every 10 years after the census. So once we have that complete and accurate count in the census um, and we make sure that all folks are represented there, redistricting is the next thing that happens which is that our political district lines are drawn to reflect the um, population in different areas. Um, and in most states across the country, it's the state legislature, the elected politicians who do this job. In Michigan, for the first time ever, average voters will be in charge of this process. And uh, that's really important because if you go to the next slide, uh, it helps to avoid gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the process uh, that happens when redistricting is done in a way to favor one group of people over the other. So intentionally drawing lines to divide communities or to give political advantage to one party over the other or give advantage to certain politicians over others. Um, as you can see by Detroit's 
uh, 14th Congressional District, which is here on the screen, it can result in some pretty odd shapes. Uh, and, and I think that a lot of people can look at some of the district lines in Michigan and across the country and say, that doesn't really look like a community that's meant to belong together, um, a community of people with shared interests. So this new redistricting commission is an opportunity for citizens to take back control and make sure that our elections um, fairly represent the communities of people who our, our politicians are elected to. Um, and the exciting thing is, if you go to the next slide right now, we have 10 days left in the application uh, period in which you can apply to be one of those 13 randomly selected commissioners who will be in charge of drawing district lines. And we want you, you listening right now, to consider signing up and applying. Um, it is an incredible opportunity to be part of Michigan's history. All you need to be is a registered voter. You don't need to have any previous qualifications or prior experiences. It's really about being able to bring your community's voice to the table and to represent people across Michigan fairly. As you can see on this slide, you can visit redistrictingmichigan.org to fill out an application online. And we have that application in English online. We also have PDF applications available in Spanish, in Bangla, and in Arabic. Translated applications that you can fill out online as well. Download and fill out right there. Then once you fill it out, you'll need to save a PDF copy of that application and schedule an appointment to have the application notarized. You do have to sign the application in the presence of a notary in order to, uh, to apply with a complete application and be part of the applicant pool. So you can go to our website to find more information about that, but you do need to have it notarized. And then you can submit it to us via email. So you never have to print the application in order to apply. If you want to go to the next slide really quickly, I know I'm running out of time. Um, but the current applicant pool is less diverse than the state as a whole. So we really need you all to apply and get involved right now. As you can see by these graphics, our, our applicant pool is older, it's more white, and it's more male than the state as a whole. So for all of you listening uh, who, who fit into a, a category of people who is part of a group, a community that you don't think is represented, we want you to apply right now. Just go to redistrictingmichigan.org. If you go to the next slide. Um, so how you get involved is to apply right now. And then you can also spread the word to your family members and community, just like the census uh, where we asked you to ask five friends to apply. Consider asking five um, friends to apply to the redistricting commission. You can find us on social media at redistrictingmi, um, and you can go to our website for more information. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the information, Sally. Um, and like you said, it is so critical this year for all of us to be represented and to be counted. So we have an opportunity, like Sally said at the beginning, this is historic. So we can definitely find a way that our democracy here in Michigan represent all Michiganders. And when I say all Michiganders, it's everybody. So please, please, please don't forget um, to do what is necessary. If you are interested, if your community is not represented, please make sure that you apply so you can have your community represented because this is gonna allow us to move our democracy forward and continue doing the work you know, for ourselves, for our community members. Thank you so much for the information, Sally. Now we will hear from Diana Konate, Policy Director with the African Community Together, and she will talk to us about how some policies have impact on immigrant communities and immigrant life. Welcome, Diana. Sorry, I was trying to figure it out. <laughs> Thanks, Sadie. Thanks for having me um, on the, the uh, town hall today. Um, as Sadie mentioned, my name is Diana Kanate. I am policy director at African Communities Together, um, and I'm based in DC. Um, African Communities Together is an organization uh, made up of African immigrants and their families, and um, the organization aims to um, do what it can to improve the lives of African immigrants here in the US. Um, so today I'll be discussing how Congress has um, responded to the COVID pandemic and what that means for immigrant families. Um, starting off really quick, um, when the pandemic first happened, um, 
um, Congress went into action and um, provided the first uh, the first funding bill it, it, uh, it passed provided funding to ramp up testing uh, and uh, testing uh, capabilities in the country and um, vaccine development. Um, after that, it passed the second bill that provided one of the main things that bill provided was um, paid um, sick and family leave for for employees. Um, the third bill, which is what, uh, the bill that most people know, is um, was called the CARES Act. Um, and um, some of the provisions that um, the CARES Act um, included were the, um, the cash payments to individuals and families um, that hopefully many of you received. Um, it created the um, Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses, um, which provided small business uh, loans to small businesses that um, then turned into grants if those small businesses use that money to pay um, payroll to keep people employed. Um, it provided an additional six hundred dollars um, in unemployment benefits to to people who were on in, unemployment, and it also expanded. Um, uh, the, the, the types of people who could get unemployment. So for example, an Uber driver who lost income because of COVID would be able to qualify for, um, for unemployment. Um, something else that it did is um, um, suspend uh, payments of, student, of federal student loans. Um, so people who were making monthly payments um, of, on federal student loans, they allowed you to postpone those payments until um, September. So those were some of the things that the CARES Act provided for. Um, the CARES Act you know, uh, was signed by the president, became law. Um, one of the things that immigrant communities were disappointed about though in that bill was that it excluded some immigrants from relief. Um, so this past Friday, the Democrats in the House, the House being the lower um, chamber in Congress, passed their own bill. Um, in, in that bill, um, there, they did include, after a lot of lobbying, a lot of, um, you know, making calls to folks in the, in the House and, you know, really pushing them on this, that bill included a lot of provisions um, that we were asking for, that immigrant communities were asking for, um, and some of those some of those um, uh, provisions include additional cash payments, and specifically um, allowing folks immigrants who file their taxes using um, ITIN numbers, which are individual taxpayer identification numbers. Um, the last bill, if the last, the CARES Act only allowed people with social security, who filed um, taxes with social security numbers to get cash payments. Um, you know, that excluded a lot of immigrants who were paying taxes, who were working and paying taxes, but they were paying taxes through um, this ITIN number. It also excluded people who, oh, it also excluded, let me wrap up really quickly because I'm getting a, <laughs> a, a, an alert, but um, it also excluded people who, who were in families. So let's say um, the wife had a social security number and her husband did not, nobody in the family could get, um, could get a payment, um, the cash payment. So essentially um, the, the new bill that passed in the house um, would allow those families to, to get that cash payment. It would expand emergency Medicaid so that um, more immigrants would qualify for uh, treatment or testing of um, the coronavirus. Um, immigrants like green card holders who have been here for less than five years, uh, people with TPS, people with DACA, undocumented folks, um, people on U visas. Um, it automatically extended work permits for people who have DACA or um, TPS. It gave it gives employment authorization to individuals in critical infrastructure, including people who work in agriculture or um, meat packers. Um, and then one of the things it also does is require that ICE conducts reviews um, of individuals in custody and prioritizes people for, um, for uh, release. So those are the things that are relevant to immigrants that were in this bill. Um, unfortunately, the bill is not law yet. 
it passed the House, it still needs to go to the Senate, it still needs to be signed by the president. But what we're asking people to do is call your senators and tell them, you know, we want the provisions from the HEROES Act to be in anything that passes um, the Senate and goes to the president's desk. Um, because we want to make sure that all immigrants are covered in any relief package because we're all in this together and we all have to be supported together. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, for um, this in-depth conversation and explanation. And as you can see right now, uh, all the three, four, five speakers who just spoke, you know, really nailed it where it is important for us to be counted why it is important for us to be part of the conversation when it comes to our democracy because things like this like she said if we don't call our legislatures if we don't let our voice be known if nobody thinks we exist because on the count day we don't show up then our voice doesn't reach nobody our needs are not addressed then you know something like the COVID-19 happened and we are set out of the margin of the conversation of how to deal with it because you know, we don't show up in our democracy a certain way. It is very important that immigrant communities continue to be involved at all levels. So um, Rima, do you know if we have any questions right now on the chat or uh, anywhere that have addressed any of the question, whether it is a census, whether it is the redistricting or whether it is um, the CARES Act and how these policies impact immigrant communities right now? We actually have a question, Sadie, for, uh, about the redistricting commission. Uh, the question was, how often is the redistricting commission required to meet? Uh, Bilal, if you're on, if you could unmute, please. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's how often is the redistricting commission required to meet? Uh, so Sally did a good job answering this in the chat, but I'll take a crack at it as well. Um, according to the Constitution, the Commission needs to meet a minimum of 15 times while they're serving within that year. So uh, that means that will take place as like a town hall. Uh, maybe in this era of COVID, that could take on a digital form that's not clear yet, and it'll be up to the Commission to decide what that looks like. But 15 throughout the state. Thank you, Bilal. Um, Sadie, I believe that's the only question for now. Oh, I'm sorry, there is one more. Um, is, are the, the commission duties similar to that of jury duty and is that an excuse activity for people who are on the commission? Great question. One of the best parts about this commission is that the, uh, your job is constitutionally protected. So like jury duty, this is an excused activity and it allows you to uh, have, a, have your position be protected wherever it may be while serving as a commissioner. Uh, wonderful. Those are the questions for now, Sadie. Great. Well, thank you very much, Bilal, for answering these questions. Uh, thank you, Rima. Now we are going to hear from Elvira Hernandez. She is Program Associate at ACLU of Michigan, and she's going to speak to us today on how, uh, what they are doing right now to try to protect vulnerable immigrant um, community members that are in detention. Welcome, Elvira. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us um, participate in your town hall. Um, I am, um, like you said, Elvira Hernandez. I'm the program associate for the ACLU of Michigan. I'm actually based out of the Grand Rapids office. Um, I work closely with our immigrant rights um, attorney and um, one of our um, senior attorneys that works out of the Grand Rapids office. Um, and basically right now we, um, along with the ACLU National Prison Project um, and Immigrant Rights Project, um, as well as the law firm of Paul Weiss, um, have filed a class action lawsuit against ICE and federal court on behalf of immigrants that are detained by ICE in the Calhoun uh, County Jail. Um, and this is all stemming and trying to, um, basically we're in a race against time to get people released, um, from civil, um, so their civil and, um, issue in regards to being detained. 
Um, so civil detention, um, our, our point is that civil detention should not be a death sentence. And right now the um, being in detention in a correctional facility um, is exactly what it is um, a death sentence because of it being this um, poultry dish, um, having people detained um, in facilities where you are sharing um, such little space um, with a larger group. Uh, many people are detained and are suffering um, with health issues um, that make them very vulnerable and they must be released. And that is why we have taken the position of filing this class action lawsuit. We're urging ICE um, for the release of the vulnerable people and reduce this jail population immediately in order um, to protect them, um, as well as protecting the jail staff and, and the community at large. Um, the number of COVID cases um, is on the rise in the detention centers, and we actually don't get a, a factual number. It just varies so much, um, but that's why we believe that it's the time to act this now and that people should in fact be released, especially with it being for civil detention. Um, we are seeking the immediate release of people um, and ex because experts are saying that the way to prevent the number of COVID cases to rise is the whole social distancing and the rigid hygiene um, practices, which this is very difficult to um, be doing while you're in detention with such a large population. Um, we do know that, for instance, um, in Calhoun, um, detained area, detained people are held in pods um, containing groups of people of 60 um, or more uh, who sleep, eat, bathe, and basically live closely. Um, we do work closely with Merck, the Michigan Immigrant Rights Center, and they are assisting us in um, doing intake. Um, so one of the points that I really want to get clear out to the community in this town hall is if people have friends or relatives that are being detained in Calhoun, to please reach out to Merck um, and their intake number or to the ACLU of Michigan. Um, Merck's number is 734-239-6863. That's their intake number. Um, and we do our intakes online through submitting a um, request for help. Thank you. Thank you, Elvira. Thank you very much for um, this information. And um, I think we are all aware that across this United States, there have been a lot of information, a lot of complaining since the COVID started that calls for um, the liberation of incarcerated people. And we know that some states, some cities, some counties have taken some measures. But the point that Elvira has made today is very important. It's like, we really need to push as a community when our folks are detained for a civil infraction in civil detention centers, we should do everything we can to ensure that they don't die because they were exposed to the COVID-19. We have seen um, deportations of Haitian introducing COVID-19 in community in Haiti that was not you know, touched by the, by the virus. And that happened exactly because of what Elvira said, where folks was detained and they contacted the virus in detention. And in their deportation, they also took the virus in another country. So this, this is something that we really have to take um, seriously. And if we have community members, if we don't have community members, please call the ACLU, please call um, 
Merck and call your legislators also, you know, the same thing as Diana said, we just have to be in the habit of calling our legislators and having our voices be heard so we can advocate for ourselves, so we can, you know, be part of the religious trusting, so we can ensure that everybody gets some rebates and some relief with the, with the, with the relief coming from the government, but also get relief from detention centers as Elvira have just um, highlighted. Now we are going to have Asra al Hawli from the Community Health and Research Center at Access tell us about the changes to emergency Medicaid. Welcome, Asra. Hi, everyone. My name is Asra al Hawli, and I am a public health coordinator at the Access Community Health and Research Center. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to commend my fellow advocates and colleagues for the wonderful work that they have been doing since the beginning of this crisis. Um, this work is very important, especially for the communities that uh, we all serve. Uh, I'm here to, today to speak about a new expansion that MDHHS has announced to the Emergency uh, Services Only Medicaid, which is also known as the ESO Medicaid, which uh, will now uh, cover uh, any COVID-19 testing and treatment. Um, and this will include any services um, on or after uh, March uh, 10th, 2020. Um, so this was a huge win um, and especially important for uh, because um, ESO Medicaid serves as a last resort for the uninsured communities. So it was important that we all rally around this to ensure that all of our state residents um, have access to the care that they need. Uh, before I move on to what this means, I just wanted to note that Yes, uh, there is a difference between full coverage Medicaid and ESO Medicaid. Uh, to be qualified for full coverage Medicaid, you must uh, not only be uh, income eligible and uh, lawfully present in the United States, but you also have to be either uh, a citizen or a um, you have to be a qualified immigrant, which uh, means having a permanent residence card or, or a green card uh, for at least five years. Uh, of course, there are some uh, Oops, sorry. <laughs> there are some uh, exceptions uh, to this, uh, such as being a refugee, uh, for example, but uh, we'll get into that <laughs> during another time. Um, so if you do not meet the criteria for full coverage Medicaid, there are still other ways for you to access healthcare coverage. And one of those ways is through the ESO Medicaid program. Um, and this program covers you regardless of your residency status. Um, and as the name states, it's used for emergency services only. So in a case of emergency, you can go to the hospital and uh, you do not have to be worried about uh, being left with medical bills. Uh, so the el eligibility criteria for your e for ESO Medicaid has not changed. Uh, the program is still available to the uninsured residents who would otherwise uh, not qualify for full coverage Medicaid, but do, but do not would qualify for full coverage Medicaid, but do not because they have not met the five-year requirement um, or they are undocumented. Uh, MDHHS has only expanded um, the services uh, that they would cover, such as. Um, such as uh, the COVID-19 testing. So uh, as I mentioned before, this program was used for emergency services only um, and such as hospital visits, but it now has expanded to include COVID-19 testing, uh, your evaluation and your treatment. And this uh, does include uh, follow-up services uh, such as outpatient visits and medications for those individuals who tested positive for COVID-19. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that if you did need help uh, with your health insurance uh, application or um, if you're just looking to uh, see what you may qualify for, you can um, give us a call at 313-203-1758. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Astra, for um, for the information. And uh, as you can see, like you said, community organizers are continuing to advocate, and advocacy have brought in this huge win, and everybody can get tested, so we don't have to stay at home, and because we are uninsured and believe that we don't have access or we are afraid of having medical bills. So please make sure that we take advantage of um, this opportunity to stay healthy and to stay safe. Um, thank you, Astra, again for your participation today. Now we will pause a little minute to see if we have any questions from our Facebook chat um, and our viewers. Rima, do you have any question at this point? 
Hi, Sadie. No, we don't have any questions right now. Okay, great. Um, so we don't have any question. Um, next, we are going to have uh, my friend Gabriela, Miss Gabriela Santiago Romero, to talk about um, the Southwest Mutual Aid Fund that they have sprung into action um, in the wake of the COVID to help support our community. Gabriela. Hi, thank you, Sadie, and thank you everyone so much for putting this together. This is really helpful and just fun to see everyone's faces and coming together and doing this work. Um, so briefly to talk about the Southwest Detroit Cares or the Southwest Detroit Mutual Aid Group, we came together very quickly after COVID hit Michigan, I think that Wednesday or Thursday, and we essentially started off as a Google form where we wanted to identify people in our community who were in need and then identify people who would be willing to volunteer and provide resources. We are working together with a lot of different organizations like DHGC, Urban Neighborhood Initiatives, um, the Office of our City Council Member, Raquel, um, Raquel Gessina Lopez. And it's been really, really beautiful to see us all come together. I currently, right now where we are is, um, I see Sadie, is a little frozen, I hope I'm good. But currently where I'm at right now, oh, I'm good. So currently where we're at right now is, um, we had an original goal of raising around $20,000. And the idea was to provide direct funding for people. We are now currently um, at about $50,000 and we're hoping to raise a 60. And we are still able to provide families with up to $300 in cash assistance, whether that be directly sent to your bank account or a check. We're able to provide families with grocery boxes. We've We've had we've had around 200 families already um, with with providing groceries. We're also providing diapers for for parents who, who are in need, um, and it's a really great group of us. It's about 20 people, um, 20 of us strong community members, organizers, neighbors who are calling our neighbors, asking them how are you doing, how can we help, and then providing those resources. Right now, if you're able to, we're still raising funds. So if you can check out our our Chuffed account, um, uh, if you also look out at Southwest Cares on Facebook. We have a Facebook page where we're going to be posting the link to our, our fundraiser. But right now, anyone who needs support, feel free to reach out to the Facebook group. We have our form there. Feel free to um, reach out to me uh, via email. My email is very simple. It's gabby at wethepeoplemi.org if you want to be get on that form and if you need support. If you're also offering support, thank you so much for the community who has come out to support us. I know that Fresh Pack has provided groceries. I know that Prince Valley has provided us um, a partnership to provide families gift cards. So thank you all so much. Anybody else out there, any local business, any organization that wants to be a part of this, please, please, please reach out and we would love all your support. Thank you. Oh my God. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the ongoing work that you have been um, involved in and the support that you have been helping provide. This is this is how our communities are. This is who we are in Detroit. This is who we are as um, as immigrant. This is who we are as human being. And it is really warming to see this much amount of work being pulled out by community members who felt that they were obligated to support their um, their neighbors and support their friends and families in this time and this is why we this is why we do what we do really thank you gabriella for um for the work and um next i will um also uh have uh, catalina rios from the southeastern michigan undocumented fund to update us about the work they have been doing also catalina you next Hi everyone, thanks Sadie. Um, thank you all for inviting me here. I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the GoFundMe um, fundraiser to support Southeast Michigan undocumented families. So we've raised almost $60,000 uh, with the support of you know everyone who has donated. Um, we've helped more than 100 families with cash assistance. Um, and I can, I, I'm going to provide the information on the chat um, in case you have any families that you want to refer to us. So all you need to do is send one of us an email um, and just give us the family's uh, name and phone number. And what we do, we just follow up with them and get to know a little bit about their story. Um, and then we provide assistance. 
uh, let's see. And I will also share the, the link to the fundraiser in case you want to share it on your social media, um, share it with you know, your family, your friends, because um, we're still raising funds. We're still receiving um, a, lot of, um, a lot of referrals that, um, you know, letting us know that families are still very much in need. So yeah, so if you have any questions, just put them down in the chat. I'll be here for a little bit more and I will also uh, provide the contact info and the link to the fundraiser. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. Same thing that I said for Gabby. I know we're running uh, out of time. Um, so next we'll have Fatima Taibi from Abyssa to also uh, update us on the work that they have been doing. Fatima, you next. Salam, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I understand we're pressed for time, so I will keep it brief. Uh, I would also like to just shout out everybody that went before me and really kind of reiterate what you said earlier, that this really shows what Detroit's immigrant community looks like. And when push comes to shove, we, we really do pull through. So um, Avisa has also had a COVID-19 uh, fundraiser. Uh, we've raised, as of now, um, almost 40 k and we have been dispersing it literally as it comes in. It's been a couple of weeks now where the the requests for aid have only increased. We had started it early on in the crisis when we knew um, that you know the governor was actually going to shut down all non-essential businesses, and a lot of folks in our communities um, actually run these businesses, right? Um, so when, I, if you think of the braiders, if you think of a lot of the you know Uber drivers, the taxi drivers, and stuff like that, they make up a very big percentage of our community, and we knew that they weren't going to qualify for stimulus checks or for any of the other you know social um, services or the safety nets that were being. Um, provided by the various states of government. So we decided to start this fundraiser because of that. And, you know, the response has been phenomenal. Uh, but unfortunately, the aid and the need for aid is still there, especially given the fact that this was the month of Ramadan. So a lot of our families were fasting and didn't have anything to break their fast with. Um, it's been very difficult for a lot of our folks. And I just want to show you guys what all the requests look like right here. These are all the people that are asking us and every day we put up another paper and we fill it up with more names. But we have been helping families with cash assistance. So we help with rent, we help with utilities. We also help with food. Um, I'd like to shout out um, Dada Salaam for also working with us in terms of creating a voucher program where we also just provide um, groceries for uh, a lot of our families. So like I said, I know we are tight on time, so I'm actually just gonna throw the link um, of our Facebook fundraiser because it's still ongoing. We're trying to hit 50K. So if y'all can get us there past that finish line, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna post it over here. And then also, if you know anybody that needs help, let me find my book, uh, you can call us at 313 Four six two nine two six five, and I'll also post that number um, below in the chat. Thank you guys so much. We greatly appreciate all the work that you do. Thank you, thank you very much um, for all of that. I can see the communities are uh, standing next to the communities and working together because I know that um, Luz Mesa with, uh, with Juan, Ka with Juan um, the Wiki Perez and Catalina have always helped uh, provide help uh, to some families, you know, with the Abisa fundraising also. So this is great. Thank you, Abisa. Thank you, uh, Catalina, uh, with the South East Michigan, you know, undocumented families. Thank you, Gabriela with Southwest Care and everybody else that is helping and supporting our communities. Your help is needed. Your help is appreciated. And we continue to to move on in this time together as one community. Um, we have next um, Marwa Ayash working with Access as a teacher at Melvin Day High School and a core team of uh, My Student Dreams, and she will be on and um, update us on the work that they do. Marwa, you next. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for letting. Thank you so much for letting me speak on 
speak today. Um, like Sadie said, my name is Marwa. I work at Access um, as an educational site leader at Melvindale High School, and I'm a core team member of my student's dream. So one of our big projects that we've been doing in the midst of this pandemic is we've been trying to raise funds for undocumented folks. So um, I'm sure there's many of you that are um, aware uh, undocumented families do not receive unemployment benefits, stimulus checks, some of them don't have um, health insurance during this time, so they're really left behind during this crisis. Um, and so we decided to create a pledge um, that directs folks to local fundraisers organized by immigrant rights leaders and organizers. We're using, we wanna use this pledge to uplift the work of local immigrant right organizers who already started donation funds for undocumented immigrants so that we can help out these folks during this time. So some of these um, immigration, um, some of these uh, organizations include ABISA, the Washington Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights, and Southwest Detroit Mutual Aid Fund. So we just want to make sure that our undocumented friends and families and folk in the area are getting the support that they need. I did drop the pledge form in the chat box. So if you want to, you know, share it, spread it on your social media, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Marwa, for all the work and all the engagement and commitment that um, you have in our community. And I'm just, I'm smiling because my heart is full because this is the community that I know. I'm an immigrant. I came here 17 years ago. And these are the folks that, you know, day in and day out have been welcoming me, welcoming my family, but also working together in this community. This is what it looks like. So I wanna thank everyone in these times uh, of helping. Um, during this stress time, uh, we are working together. Our cities also are working together. So next we have Roberto Torres, the director of the City of Detroit Immigrant Affairs and Economic Inclusion. And he will let us know what support is available right now today for immigrant businesses. Welcome, Roberto. When I started this, good afternoon. Uh, I, I also want to echo what you said, Sadie, about all the organizations. I'm, I'm just very impressed at, at how our community has uh, has responded to the current crisis and uh, responding to needs that uh, are going unmet in other circles. Um, city government, uh, I've always said in economic development that city government doesn't create jobs. We facilitate the creation of jobs. That means that people, uh, uh, business owners, they create the jobs. In this case, what we're saying is all of these agencies are actually providing the service. City government doesn't need to provide the service. City government needs to support the provision of those services. So, so we're doing that with, uh, with the small business community. Uh, one of the things that we did is uh, we uh, collaborated with the EGC, uh, our CREO office, uh, Tech Town, and SDBA, and a number of other people. You mentioned Juan Carlos. So Juan Carlos is a part of the, the coalition. This was how do we help out those businesses to access funding uh, that is available to businesses, but folks may not be uh, aware of that. And so we, we've done a number of seminars. Uh, we made sure that we did town hall meetings with the business owners so that they could understand if they qualified for unemployment, how to apply for, for unemployment benefits. Um, when it came to uh, applying for the PPP program, how does one uh, how does one apply for it in a language that they understand? And so we made all of those provisions to be able to do that. But even uh, even having that, we also understood that there are a number of businesses, immigrant businesses in our community, that do not qualify for those benefits. So even though Tech Town had its programs, DEGC had its programs. Federal stimulus had its programs. Um, there were a number of people that did not qualify. And so the work that many of these organizations are doing uh, is helping to fill that gap. So we in the city uh, decided that we were going to uh, look at other communities and to see what they were doing. And in places like New York, Chicago, LA, many of those communities were actually adopting uh, a fund uh, for immigrant needs in the community. 
And so we started looking at national foundations and we're in right now uh, in the process. And we're happy that many of the organizations that are represented today are a part of that conversation. But we're in the process of being able to bring funds into our community that is going to support the work that you're doing. And uh, our, our goal with the city is not just to uh, have it be a one-time fund, but to actually use that as a way to uh, find matching dollars and to grow it so that the needs of our community will not be a crisis. Uh, it won't be that we're caught in having to respond, but that we already have a system in place to address those needs. So I, I'm, I'm enthusiastic at where we're at. Um, I wish I could share more, but that will be forthcoming uh, shortly. So uh, just on behalf of, of the city, I wanna thank all the organizations that are doing their work, continue to do that uh, and know that your effort doesn't go without recognition from the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto, for all the work that you all will also do, because I know I sit in so many Zoom calls with you when it's come to immigrant issues and that you are at heart. You know, I have to say this shout out to my director of immigration affairs um, because he's very working hard for us today. So we thank you, Sadie. But let me say this. It doesn't happen without, uh, you know, collaboration with our city council. And we are blessed to have uh, Raquel Casanel Lopez. Uh, at the leadership uh, in her district uh, because she helps take our conversation of immigration to, uh, to the next level. And so it helps to have voices in different levels. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's, it comes back to that, having a voice, being counted, being present, being part of the redistressing committee. You know, this is what it is about. It's about us having a voice and being engaged. So let's remain engaged. Let's be counted. Let's sit on the redistressing committee. Let's make our voices heard so we can support all our great organizers, our great leaders who are right now working hard for us to be able to do that and have the impact that we want. So thank you very much for being here. Thank everybody who we have in here today. Um, we are going to now, um, I think Rima is down for our, our Q&A sessions. Um, if you have any questions in the chat for our speakers today, uh, please make sure that you, you type it so we can address those. Um, do we have any questions, Rima? No, Sadie, we don't have any questions. We don't have no questions? No. Okay. I think okay. it's our speakers did a great job sharing the information, so. <laughs> This is great. And thank for all the information and the work that they are doing again in our immigrant communities. So during this stress time, we tend to forget to enjoy life as it is, right? It is a little things that we can do daily to lift our spirit, whether it is a walk, you know, I miss being outside my house, um, you know, uh, motivation. So we come from any, from many different um, communities, cultures, religious, and one thing that is great about all of it is that our cultures is now how do we identify with our cultures through food through dance through music in all cultures we do that we listen to music we like my grandma food you know we we like to dance together at our wedding and so on and so forth so today we have a little surprise and i am so excited to close today town hall we have usama baalki i hope i didn't kill the name and uh michael abraham from the National Air Orchestra Building Bridges Program, who will give us a little bit of information about their program and who will close us out today with a wonderful piece from their orchestra. Usama and Michael, you are on. Hello there, everyone. How are you all today? Thank you so much for having us. We're glad to be here. Usama couldn't join us today and he apologizes, but the show must go on. Um, the National Arab Orchestra, uh, the, uh, the mission has been to preserve and integrate Arab music um, through the medium of the arts. And we've been doing that for the past 10 years through our various concerts, educational programming, like our Building Bridges to Music program, and as well as various other workshops within the classroom at the university level and within the community as well. Um, while the concert halls while uh, the current situation doesn't allow us to really get together for a concert, um, you can still 
we invite you to join us on our social media pages so that you can take advantage of the many wonderful things that we have in store for you over there. Um, we have a series of workshops that we are preparing uh, and they're all free and available for the public. We will, we will be having a monthly variety show. We also um, have weekly interviews with spots on various subjects of Arab music as well as um, uh, artist bios of Arab American artists and other members of the orchestra who are not of, um, of Arab uh, background uh, that perform and work regularly with the orchestra. So to kind of illustrate some of that for you and give you a little taste of what we did, um, last month we created a little uh, video collaboration in isolation where members of our orchestra from all over the country recorded and worked together on a song as well as guest artists from from New York and in Lebanon, and uh, we hope that you enjoy this little uh, piece, Jaydi Salam, which means "Bring Me Peace" by the singer Fayrouz. <laughs> God, this is so beautiful, man. I have not seen this before. I'm, I'm, 
I'm speechless. Uh, thank you, Usama. Thank you, Michael, and all those um, who are in the National Air Orchestra. This is so beautiful. It brings tears to my eyes. I cannot thank you very much. It actually reminded me that um, I do teach African dance class every um, every Tuesday, and I was here uh, moving on my chair. I'm like, oh my god, music, music, and um, you know, this is this is how we wanted to 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 end with you guys today. Um, thank you thank you thank you for that um we want to hear from um from another activist and um another thing that is important to our community so um welcome muhammad um that will talk to us about um the dps of for eat campaign assalamu alaikum um or in other words uh, may peace be with may peace be with you all um, thank you for having me today. I myself am, am an immigrant. Um, I came here from Bangladesh at the age of about seven. So I appreciate the, all the work that you guys have been doing. And I also appreciate you guys giving me this opportunity to speak about something that sits very close to my heart. Um, but before I begin talking about our movement, I would just like to briefly talk about what is Eid. So that's the question of the day. What is Eid? The holidays of Eid are known as Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Fitr celebrates the ending of Ramadan, the current beautiful holy month where Muslims all over the globe fast from dawn to dusk. And Eid al-Adha commemorates Hajj, the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, and honors Prophet Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice. These are some pictures of the Detroit community members celebrating Eid. During the holidays, we anxiously wait for family to arrive from different states, followed by exchanging gifts and enjoying great meals and spending precious time with our loved ones. However, the essence of holiday season does not seem to exist for Muslim kids like me because our educational responsibilities tend to, tend to overshadow our opportunity to celebrate our holidays. The Muslim community of Detroit has been organizing for the past three years, urging the Detroit Public Schools Community District to acknowledge the holidays of Eid. After promising to recognize the Eid holidays, last month, the school district and the teachers union approved the calendar for the upcoming 2020-2021 school year without observing the Eid holidays. Now we are hoping to amend the calendar with your support. So we would like to request everyone to join this campaign by texting OFF for Eid, O-F-F, the number 4, E-I-D, to 52886. Join this movement to receive updates as we work to observe the Eid holidays on the school calendar. We would also appreciate and like to ask everyone to record a video of yourself showing your support for this campaign and sharing it on your social media platforms with the hashtag DPSCD off for Eid. Appreciate you guys for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mohammed. So as he explained, it is always important for us to continue celebrating our differences and our cultures and um, creating spaces for everyone that is represented to also have um, have access and the families the muslim families in the district um are actually you know engaged with the students in the district um to you know amend the district calendar a certain way where our muslim students can actually spend it at home family and celebrate um, this uh, this huge holidays, and uh, thank you, Mohammed, again for um, for being here and uh, drawing our attention to the work that you guys do. We would love also to hear what you have um, to tell us uh, about this time, about the topic that we discuss. Um, if you want to hear more, uh, do you have questions? Do we have anything in the Facebook chat uh, to address this situation? Do we have any question right now? Hi, Sadie. No, we don't. Okay. So great. Thank you all for being here. Like we said at the beginning, we are going to continue to uh, to respond to the question 
if you have them later, let us know and we will make sure that we address this. This town hall is truly, truly um, a group effort um, and a labor of love. So before we go, I would like to ask all our partners to turn on their videos. Roberto. So before we say goodbye, as our partners are turning on their video, before we say goodbye, I would love to remind you to call our Michigan Senator, to call Senator Stabino, to call Senator to please ask them to uphold the provision in the HEROES Act that are meant to meet the needs of immigrant communities. Ask Senator Stabinow and Senator Peters not to allow provision for immigrants to be removed during the Senate negotiation. Rima, would you yes. like to us off from a goodbye? Yes. Uh, to everyone celebrating, and we would like to send you off with a goodbye from Gloria. We'll come back to Gloria. Sadie? Uh, doing a tea. No. <laughs> Perdí el audio. Este, si puedes este, uh, despedir, por favor. I'm Sadie. Um, no, tengo, no tengo el audio. Okay. La tansa antam la estimara tlaxa o ta'dad el sakani. So, Aid Fatr Saeed. Thank you so very much. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Shukran jazilan wa ila lika. Thank you so much, Saeed. Saeed? Merci beaucoup encore une fois. Jogo jif, jokanjal in serer, and bon korite. Doanity to all of you guys. And finally, Katie in ASL. Thank you so much, Katie, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for being here today.